because enough, enough of the Republican caucus being held hostage by, again, a very small group of malcontents in comparison to the broad majority of Republican legislators who are just coming from their districts trying to do their job. This is not a question of purity. This is a question of practicality. Guess what? None of you people in Congress are pure enough for me when it comes to your principles. None of you. Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. Please scan your barcode. Your liberty ain't gone, but yeah, it's on hold. Where did it come from and where did it go? What's up, what's up? Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. I, I've been gone too long. I apologize. Uh, today, we are going to be breaking down Ben Shapiro's latest screed and talking about the bill that Mike Johnson is pushing. They're trying to send billions more of your tax money, which you just got done paying yesterday, to Ukraine, Taiwan, uh, Israel, obviously. We we can't afford it, ladies and gentlemen, but that's not going to stop Mike Johnson, the guy who consistently, consistently argued that we should not be funding the proxy war in Ukraine. He also argued against the reauthorization of FISA and warrantless spying. And all of a sudden, he's going to bring standalone bills, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to bring standalone bills, the thing we've been asking for for all this time. He's finally going to do it. Good news, right? Well, until you actually think about the, the real angle with which he's going about this. And the real angle, unfortunately, is that the GOP and the Democrats are very divided on which proxy war they want to fund. Thanks to the foot soldiers in the streets of New York, the Democrats are finally willing to not fund Israel in their war against Gaza. And the GOP is finally, at least theoretically, willing to not fund Ukraine. But if you separate them, given that the divide in Congress is so 50-50, you could have the Democrats come together to push the funding for Ukraine over the line. And simultaneously, you can have the GOP come together to push the funding for Israel over the line. Everybody goes home happy. All of us go home sad. That's the game plan. I see right through you, Mike Johnson. Man. And get this. Thomas Massey clarified this morning that he, at the tail end of his tweet, he says something to the effect of, you know, we're bringing these four these four standalone bills and the fourth one is just a supplemental for security and you know protecting the homeland whatever whatever massey goes ah actually that's the tiktok ban so <laughs> he won't even say it by name because he knows it's so unpopular but that's that's what they're going to try and push through so my goodness man my goodness well i just got back from corpus christi had a great time i am off to maryland this weekend if you guys are out and about, uh, or even in the area, I would appreciate if you guys come out and say hi. I'll be giving a speech at some point on Saturday, and it's uh, just search LP Maryland State Convention, and it'll pop up, and you guys can grab tickets. Uh, man, what a crazy world. What a crazy world. Without further ado, let's get into Ben Shapiro, our guy, our best friend. Wink, wink. All right, Ben, what you got to say? So Joe Biden, the president of the United States, he keeps saying one word over and over and over. That word is don't. He said it to the Taliban with regard to attacks on American troops. And then, of course, they did. He said it to the Russians with regard to going into Ukraine. And then, of course, they did. And he said it to the Iranians with regard to directly attacking Israel. He said don't. And then, of course, they did. All of which means that Joe Biden is not a credible player on the world stage. Now, there's something in foreign policy called deterrence. It's the single most important concept of the post-war era. Deterrence is the idea, according to the Defense Department, that you can prevent action by the existence of a credible threat of unacceptable counteraction and or a belief that the cost of action outweighs the perceived benefits. In other words, you do not attack me because I am threatening you. If you attack me, I will clock you into next week. You know who is an expert at deterrence, oddly enough? President Donald Trump. He was excellent at deterrence. You know, another example of deterrence is exactly what Israel did to Iran in striking their generals at the consulate in Syria. And you know, another example of deterrence? Well, I guess it would be what Israel did as a response to that. You know, tit for tat deterrence. It's also known as an escalatory trap, which Shapiro is advocating on behalf of inexplicably, particularly given that these are not our homeland, but he is he is correct that deterrence does play a role in geopolitics, obviously. This is the whole concept behind mutually assured destruction. This is why 
everybody who's racing to have a nuclear weapon is because they realize that once they have one, no matter how abusive they are to the rest of the world or to their people, a la North Korea, they will likely be left alone. And that's why Iran has been rumored to be working on one for so long. Whether or not they are, I'm not sure. But certainly Trump, with all of his bluff and bluster when it came to geopolitics and telling people, I'll blast you in the next next week. He famously told the Iranians something to that effect, saying, you will be struck in a way that few people have ever been struck before in human history. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Which, I, the way I read that back then, I think it was 2018, he was threatening essentially nuclear warfare. Uh, woof, scary. Threat that he uttered was perfectly credible. He kept everybody off balance. It was sort of a madman theory of foreign policy. You never knew when he meant it, and you never knew when he didn't. It didn't matter whether you understood it. It only mattered whether he understood it. He could push you off the ball simply by saying, if you cross that line, you don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be a really bad, super big league bad. And other nations took that seriously. The Taliban took that seriously. Russia took that seriously. China took that seriously. And Iran took that seriously. But when Joe Biden over and over and over again keeps saying don't, and then other parties do, and the United States does not respond. And not only does the United States not respond, it slow walks aid to America's allies. So even America's allies cannot respond. The United States intervenes to tell America's allies not to do too much. Just to clarify, what are we responding to? Uh, serious question. What, what has happened to America? Because it seems as if he is conflating the security interests of Israel with that of America and not not you know explicating as to why like why why are you framing it this way because from my vantage point america has not been struck by either russia or iran so what are we talking about unless you're talking i mean i know he's not but there was uh, american troops that were i think harmed i'm not sure if they were killed uh, in the middle east a couple months ago but Again, I would just argue that we shouldn't have bases over there in, in Iraq 20 years after the war began. Setting that aside, uh, let's hear what else he has to say. Then it turns out that the party that is deterred is not, in fact, the opponents, the enemies of the United States. The party that is deterred is the United States herself. Now, it is one thing to suggest that the United States should be deterred from forward action by the presence of, say, the Soviet Union. But to suggest that the United States should be deterred from providing full aid to Ukraine, for example, such that Ukraine is not overrun. And that, that we should be deterred by the possibility that Vladimir Putin is going to unleash nuclear weapons, which of course is not a credible threat when it comes to simply maintaining the current battle lines in Ukraine. That's Well, that's an assertion without any evidence, is it not? How can you possibly know? I mean, it's, it's weird because there's always this, uh, you know, dichotomous, claim about both Putin and the leadership in Iran, that there are these irrational madmen uh, hell-bent on conquest, and yet simultaneously, it's not a valid claim that he might use nuclear weapons. Well, why, Ben? How do you know that? And how do you know, why, why would Putin have risked invading Ukraine and violating, you know, all the norms of the neoliberal world order and ultimately alienating Russia entirely from the entire Western financial establishment and NATO and everything else, if they weren't, if they didn't perceive it to be very vital to their interests. And if they perceive it to be so vital to their interests that they would invade and suffer all of these consequences, why would they then not, if they were losing that war, resort to nuclear weaponry? Now, I'm not saying that they will, but you can't say definitively that they won't. Can you? Well, no, certainly you can't, especially seeing as Putin's a madman. So this is this is just an assertion, and I don't think one that's based on any sort of logic. Stupid. When the suggestion is that the United States should be deterred by Iran, and that's what's happening right now. Iran is saying, we fired 300-odd missiles, drones at Israel. Most of those got knocked down. Virtually all of them got knocked down. But don't go further, or we are going to go further. And Iran is openly saying that right now. Iran is saying... If Israel were to counterattack, then they would unleash 1,500 cruise missiles, for example. But why are they saying that? They're saying that because the Israelis struck their generals at a consulate, which is 
through international law, perceived to be the land of Iran. It's essentially a strike on Iran itself, at least in the terms of international law. So their counter strike against Israel was their response. And they're saying, okay, you did this. You took out some of our top generals. We, we countered. We didn't actually end up killing anybody. Thank God. And it's over. Not, not only that, but also Kirby, the uh, spokes hole for the Biden administration has been pretty damn clear that the Israelis did not. And I, I covered this on my last show, my last episode, rather that the Israelis did not communicate their plans to strike the Iranian generals in Syria. However, Iran has been through back channels communicating with the Biden administration as to their response to Israel, which is exactly why they waited over, well, over 10 days, I think it was approaching two weeks. And then they also gave 48 hours notice in which both the IDF and the American military were prepared and equipped to counter the, the vast majority of the volley. Some, some estimates it's over 90% of the artillery fired was in fact stopped before it landed. So why would they do that? I think the answer is obviously that the Iranians are not interested in escalating further. And also, in that interim period, that 10 to 14 day period, after the generals were struck and killed, in total violation of international law, they also said, we will not counterattack if there is a ceasefire in Gaza. Now, does that sound like the actions of the most irrational party? Now, I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that, that it's not aspects of that aren't just simply PR and perhaps they don't really care about the Palestinians at all. But even if it is only PR, that is still an offer the IDF could have accepted. They chose not to, and Iran responded. But they did not respond in an over-the-top fashion, and they gave them notice so as the damage would not be absolutely over the top. And while that volley was en route, they also said, hey, it's over now. <laughs> no more. We don't, want, we don't want to escalate these things further. And immediately Netanyahu and his, his camp said, okay, well, we're actually going to be planning a counter strike. In fact, there was, uh, some sort of air action that was coming from both the Royal Air Force the, out of the UK, as well as Israel, uh, earlier this morning. I have no updates as of now, if that is in fact en route to Iran to counter strike, but it's a very perilous paradigm and ballistic missiles. And the United States is then putting pressure on Israel. The United States is the deterred party. Deterred, being deterred is a sign that you are the weaker party in any conflict. Because, of course, the stronger party typically is not deterred. Typically. See, that, that's a, a, a bizarre argument, too. Because just because you're the strongest doesn't mean that you have to constantly be the aggressor or the escalating force in any conflict. You can also, uh, from a position of strength, negotiate for peace. Can you not? So... Uh, once again, I find this this logic deeply flawed that, that, well, the more powerful party has to be the one that can, continues to escalate things. That's not the case. In fact, you don't have to be that. I would like, I would like it if it weren't the case. And if it is the case that it, the strongest party must always escalate, then you're basically advocating on behalf of complete conquest, conquest and domination of the world just simply based off of military might, setting aside morality or principles or anything else. It seems like a very uh, irreligious perspective. Again, it is the weaker party who is worried that the cost of action will outweigh the perceived benefit. Typically, if, if you're on the playground, it is not the bully who is being deterred by the weakling, it's the weakling who's being deterred by the bully. When it comes to foreign policy, the United States has the world's largest and most powerful military presence spanning the globe in terms of technology far more advanced than anything on the table by a factor of probably five. And yet it is the United States that is over and over being deterred by significantly smaller powers, which, of course, is why smaller powers are feeling their oats right now. Now, let's let's talk a little bit about that, because it, it seems as if the claim is that simply because we're the strongest we there's no there's no reason that we wouldn't be escalating things aside from you know cowardice or uh having been deterred from the Iran by the iranians 
I don't think that's the case at all. In fact, I think there's a much more valid claim to be made that we ought to be cautious in this moment simply because we are financially destitute. And also, there is a financial alliance led by Russia at this point, along with China in the BRICS, that is challenging the U.S. dollar. And if you continue to spend into oblivion and you also continue to use the sanction regime to try and, you know, basically force the rest of the world into accordance with our own you know, preferred geopolitical structure, well, then you might expedite the demise of the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world, in which case it is actually very much to the benefit of the American people not to escalate this into a hot world war. Setting aside the moral aspects of risking every man, woman, and child on Earth in nuclear hellfire, I think that there's plenty of reasons that we ought to uh, be a little bit more cautious with these things. Don't you think? I think so. Let's get back to Ben. Goodness, Ben. Can you say one thing I agree with, please? So the question is why? Why exactly has it become sort of rote, point of course, for other smaller parties to deter the United States? The answer obviously is not insufficiency of American materiel. The answer obviously is not insufficiency of America's military might. America is so far beyond, for example, the Chinese military in terms of advancement, that the idea that China would go to full-scale war with the United States, that'd be the biggest mistake China ever made. How are we still living in this, this dream world where nuclear powers can go to war with one another and it would be the biggest mistake China ever made, but not also our biggest mistake ever? Like, anybody? Does anybody, like, actually think about this rationally anymore? Like, can we win a conventional war against China or Russia or both? I, well, maybe. I'm not, I'm honestly, I'm 100% not sure. However, just taking it on face value that yes, we can. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter because they have nuclear weapons. So if this escalates out of control, it ultimately does, there is no winner. So you have to be more prudent. This, this, you know, big dicking of the planet is inevitably going to end in the destruction of the human species. And it just seems as if no one is actually telling the truth about how dangerous this paradigm is. And if that's true of China, which has nuclear weapons, think about Iran, which does not have nuclear weapons and whose ballistic missile system is so bad that half of the rockets it just fired at Israel fell in its own territory or the territory of other countries before they even hit Israeli airspace. So why? I, I love the assertion there that that because their counterstrike a few days ago against Israel was not very destructive, which you would think Ben would actually think is a good thing. He portrays it as weakness on their part, as opposed to prudence on their part. That in fact, perhaps they were not trying to have mass casualties on the Israeli side because they don't want this to escalate, but they did want to save face and send a message that if you strike our generals at our consulate in Syria, well, there's going to be some level of response. But instead, it's portrayed as, well, they're not a valid threat. So who cares what they say? Do whatever they want or do whatever we want to them and damn the consequences. But again, what's left to the sideline is that what we're talking about is not strictly Iran. We're talking about Iran and we're talking about Hezbollah and we're talking about the Houthis and we're talking about Russia and we're talking about the CCP and we're talking about probably a handful of other nations that aren't even on my radar at this point. But this is not a... a you know, 1991 invasion of Iraq against Saddam Hussein to defend the Kuwaitis, you know, scare quotes. This is a much, much bigger deal, but it's still being discussed by Ben Shapiro as he grasps on to the vestiges of neoconservatism in this country. And it's just, it's just extraordinarily dangerous. And it, it, I, I hate the, the, the false bravado that comes with you know, commentators as they try and make it sound as if we're still the bad, baddest motherfuckers on the planet. It's like, yeah, well, maybe we are, but it doesn't matter because we're up against billions of people and also hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of nuclear weapons. You have to start to treat the rest of the world as if they have some say in how things go. And if you don't, eventually that clash of civilizations will arise. Why is America being deterred? And the answer is simple moral cowardice. The United States under Joe Biden 
has become a morally cowardly force. The United States under Joe Biden has basically decided that any engagement in the world's fear is some sort of act of aggression. No, <laughs> that's just <laughs> obviously false. But it's 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 interesting because, you know, Shapiro has certainly globbed on in some ways to the America first movement and the Trump movement, even though he has been uh, a bit outside of it and a bit of an antagonist towards Trump. But it's it's just obviously not the case that that the Biden administration has you know, gone full non-intervention. You know, they they have they have advocated on the behalf of, uh, along with Congress, in spending hundreds of billions of dollars in these proxy wars, and they have never described it as aggression. They have always described it as defense, consistently. Now, I don't necessarily agree with their their claims, but they have not they have not argued what Ben is arguing. So it's in fact a straw man on his part. And you know how, how much I'm not a fan of the Biden administration, but even, even they, I will defend at times. And even so much as funding our allies so those allies can defend themselves with forward action to deter, for example, Iran from doing this again. That would be some sort of American aggression that would escalate things. The reality is that when it comes to the Middle East, every single conflict is a game of chicken. The game of chicken, as we all know, is a game wherein two sides both drive toward a cliff and whoever stops closest to the cliff without driving over wins the game of chicken. The worst case scenario is you're the one who goes off the cliff. But when it comes to the United States versus other countries, we have both the best gas and the best brakes. The reality is that if there were to be a cliff and if we were to hit that cliff, the significant impact would be on Iran and not on the United States. <laughs> oh man what a crazy metaphor and what a, what a crazy path to advocate for you know with with any level of seriousness i mean he is explicitly arguing in favor of a game of chicken because we'll win it <laughs> and there and even if we lose it which is what he says if we slam into that cliff which i think it would mean you fall off of the cliff that it will still be worse for Iran than it will for us. Okay, well, assuming that's the case, just take it on face value. W assuming it's worse for them, it would also be bad for us. And how is it a benefit to us? Is there any is there any actual claim as to why this is in our interests other than standing with our ally? Because I can't see one. I see tremendous risk to our financial situation, as well as to our people and our troops. And I don't see a major upside here. And he completely dismisses the concept that this can escalate into a wider war, particularly given that we are actively funding a proxy war against the largest nuclear power on planet Earth, aka Russia. And we're also consistently saber rattling against the Chinese when it comes to Taiwan. So you can't envision a way in which getting ourselves bogged down in a war against Iran would ultimately be a net negative to the American people and in fact catastrophic to us. Perhaps Russia does move on Poland or some NATO territory. I don't think they will, but they see the U.S. military bogged down in, in Iran. What do they do then? I don't know. Does China move on Taiwan? I don't know. What if they do? Are we going to then try and have a three front front world war? Do you, can you see the escalation? It's so obviously there. This is not like fear mongering nonsense. These are three active bills that Mike Johnson is trying to pass this week that are all proxy wars. You can't see the escalatory trap here. It couldn't be more obvious to me, but apparently Shapiro only sees we are stronger, so we will. We have the best gas, we have the best brakes, we'll stop before we hit the cliff, and even if we hit the cliff, which I don't know how you hit a cliff, you usually fall off, but setting that aside, it'll be worse for the Iranians than it will for us. Well, you know what that means is that it's also bad for us, because if it's worse for them, worse implies that it's still bad for us. So how is it good? Where's the upside? Make the claim. I haven't seen it. And I don't think he will. It's very frustrating.
The United States is already engaged in wartime activity against Iran. It was American forces striking down drones directly from Iranian territory. And yet, again, it is Joe Biden who is acting the weakling, not just with regard to Iran directly, but with regard to Hezbollah. Uh, this is so crazy. All right, so Joe Biden is the commander in chief, theoretically. I'll put it in scare quotes for you guys. But he's he's describing Biden as a weakling while simultaneously saying that the U.S. military is engaged in essentially war with Iran already because our military was used to shoot down drones. Okay, so which is it? Is Biden a weakling? Because if he were if he were to have not done that, certainly Shapiro's hair would be on fire. But he did do that, and he's still being described as a weakling. Because ultimately, anything other than outright war against the Iranians will be advertised as weakness from the Shapiros of the world and the neoconservatives of the world and the Dan Crenshaws, you know, you know, the, the normal types. And I just, I cannot disagree more with this claim. Now, I do think that Biden wants to avoid a wider war, not out of any principle, <laughs> certainly not because he's a peacenik who found morality in his 80th year of life, but rather it's electorally damaging to the highest level that his supporters are absolutely furious. And if there is actually a hot war against Iran, it will galvanize the Democrats to vote for RFK Jr., I think, or not vote in a way that will make it almost impossible for them to even, scare quote, win the election against Trump. Eh, man. With regard to Hamas, which is a basically defunct terror group at this point. The only reason that is happening is because Joe Biden does not have the courage of American convictions. This is not an argument for America to be involved in more. This is an argument that American deterrence relies on credible threat of force. This, this is not an argument for America to be involved in war. He just said that America is involved in war, and he still described Biden as being a weakling and demonstrating cowardice and the lack of American convictions, whatever that means. So... The only way that he could not be described as a weakling would be for him to be even more overtly involved in this war. So this is just, there's a lie here, and I think it's a clear one, but I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but from my vantage point, it seems quite clear that he is in fact advocating for escalation and, and further involvement from the American military in this conflict, which would ultimately amount to war. And that in a world where America's deterrence is gone, everybody gets a lot more aggressive. The world becomes a lot more violent. There's this theory out there from both the sort of far libertarian right and from the far left Noam Chomsky crew that the way that world wars start is through a series of escalating steps that no one can stop. And the other way, there are two ways the world wars start. For the record, I think that these escalating steps can be stopped. You just have to stop fucking doing them. <laughs> But yeah, that's how that's how most wars start is that there's escalations. You do this, we do that, we seize your money, you do this, we put sanctions, you do that. We <laughs> you know, like this is exactly how it works. So I don't even understand. No, but this is the the far right libertarians and the far left Chomskys of the world. They perceive that this is the only war only way that world wars come about. Well, no, I don't think it's the only way. You could just have some madmen that that sets it off. But yeah, Broadly speaking, that is how human interaction works, is that you escalate. Be before you get to the stage of being willing to end human beings' lives all over the world, you would think that there would be escalations that happened from the beginning until you know, fire, you know, shots are fired. Obviously, that's how it works. So, But he, he, he frames it as if like this is such a nonsensical assertion by these far-right libertarian types. It's like, no, it's just obviously logical. Ugh. That can be one of them when you have a relative balance of power. But when you have one full on dominant power, the way the world war starts is by simply mistaking your way into it by failure of credibility. The reality is that the United States owes it to the West to be an iron wall and to provide enough support to its allies that those allies can be an iron wall against forces of, say, Iran. And yet that is not what the Biden administration is pursuing. And that is a moral shortcoming. That is a question of will. And it's a question of common sense. Once again, this assertion that that we are, in fact, this omnipotent, omnipotent, unchallengeable superpower. I just I just couldn't disagree more. I mean, 
Are, are we the strongest military? Yes, I would say so. Is our nuclear arsenal probably the most advanced? It's, it's arguable, but it's certainly close when it comes to Russia. But in terms of population size, in terms of financial condition, we are no longer in such a dominant position that we can risk and, and dominate everybody on earth all the time, no matter what they say, no matter how many of them come together with one another to, to push back. It's just laughably wrong. It's just not, it's not living in reality. It's not the current situation that we're existing under. It's, it's some sort of, you know, 1995 hagiography that's been extrapolated into modern times. It's totally, totally not applicable any longer. I mean, the, the, the worldview that Ben Shapiro espouses is one of 1995 America. We just, we just won the first Iraq war in such a dominant fashion our national debt was somewhere in the neighborhood of three or four trillion now we're talking about having lost multiple wars of the past 20 years i mean lost or quagmire stalemate i think that they were lost but whatever whatever perspective you hold on that they certainly weren't raging successes then you add on top of that 35 almost 35 trillion dollars in debt with interest payments alone on that north of 1 trillion over the next 12 months making it one of if not the largest expenditure of the federal government keeping in mind the federal government only brings in around 5 trillion a year so over 20 percent of that will be sent to interest payments alone do can you can you wrap your head around that ben i'm sure you're good at finance you have to be able to see that if you are spending 20 percent of your income on debt carry you're going to ultimately go bust particularly when you're spending more than three or four trillion dollars more than you bring in oh and might i add yes you are still the largest economy in the world and yes you bring in a tremendous amount of tax receipts but it doesn't matter because you're still spending way more than you bring in to put pressure on israel not to actually take any sort of aggressive action against iran believing that this will lead to some sort of escalation now it seems to me that when you fire again 300 drones and missiles at a sovereign state that is the escalation and the big problem for Israel is if they don't do anything with regard to Iran going forward, well, then Iran is going to feel like they got away with something. This is this is just astonishing. OK, so he does not bring up at one, not even one time in this 12 minute monologue. Does he bring up the fact that the IDF struck the Iranian generals at their consulate in Syria in total violation of international law and, might I add, counter to at least the, the public wishes of the Biden administration. But his framing on this is that, well, if, if Israel doesn't respond to this, this, what it was, which was a counterattack from the Iranians, well, then they can't save face. Okay, but what about the other side? What about Iran trying to save face with their people and, and demonstrate that they are a powerful force? It's like, it's like the, it's so weird because, you know, just because I, I'm able to look at these nations and, and not have any favorites in them, it sometimes people that are like CNN propagandized, they will perceive it to be favoritism of one side, which I don't favor, just simply because I'm actually applying the same exact principles that Shapiro is here for Israel. I'm applying the exact same rationale for Iran. And I'm saying, well, you can't kill our generals at our consulate or at all, without us having some sort of response. He uses this logic right now that, well, Iran fired 200 missiles. Sure, they didn't kill anybody, but regardless, they have to respond, and the Biden administration is telling them not to, and that's absurd. They have to respond. Okay, Ben, well, then why shouldn't Iran have responded after what happened? Well, oh, I'm sure he would argue, well, it's because they, they were responsible for the planning of October 7th. Do we know that? Can we prove it? No. It's just, you know nameless intelligence agency sources claim like I, I have no idea maybe they did i don't know that would certainly be an escalation but there's escalations that happened prior to that there's strikes from the idf against israel or excuse me uh against iran in syria repeatedly repeatedly this has been going on this is an escalations or back and forth uh, my point is regardless of who you think is ultimately most culpable the reality is is that neither party is innocent neither party is wholly good and moral and neither party actually holds our best interests at heart 
and neither side of this conflict is ultimately a definitive win for the American people. In fact, I think either side would represent a net negative for the American people if we get involved any further. Yes, they failed this time militarily. But what happens when they have a nuclear weapon? Right now, the United States is being deterred in Ukraine by a nuclear Russia. If you're Iran, aren't you moving forward as fast as possible with a nuclear weapon? <laughs> 40 years, my entire fucking life, I've been hearing this, that Iran is moving forward on its nuclear weapon. Like, I don't know, maybe they are. If I were them, I probably would be. But again, this is such a bizarre perspective that right now the United States of America is being ter deterred by Russia because of their nuclear arsenal. Yeah, no, the fuck? Yeah, we should be, dude. Of course we should be. Okay, so the argument that clearly the claim that he's making, you have to you have to read the tea leaves to actually get to what he's saying. But what is he saying? He is saying that if you don't fuck up the Iranians now, well, then they're going to get nukes and then you won't be able to. Okay, now from an Iranian perspective, now again, put yourself in the Iranian perspective, the leadership of Iran. With this rationale, what would you be doing? Well, obviously, you'd be trying to get a nuke as fast as possible because the Shapiros of the world are advocating that you be toppled and conquered before you can get your hands on one. Whereas the, the obvious, you know, peaceful answer is to say, we're not going to invade you, but we're also going to ask that you don't create nuclear weapons. And if you do, well, then, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But that's not his, that's not his worldview at all. And it's just, it's just bizarre. Like, this is why I, I consistently say that the only way you can, you can like come to a, a firm good side, bad side dynamic in your analysis on these wars is if you genuinely do not perceive one side or the other to be as human, as good, as worthy of human rights as you are. I really believe that because like all of the things he's saying are in some ways logical, but he's only applying it to one side. All you have to do is apply it to both sides and you go, oh yeah, yeah, they're both, they're both in the wrong. They both have some righteous claims and ultimately we shouldn't be involved. Like that's the, <laughs> that's the obvious rational approach. If you, all you have to do is just perceive both the Iranians and the Israelis to be human beings that also have their own interests and their own, their own, uh, you know, preferences for their security and things like that. Like, yeah, then, then all of a sudden, all of what I'm saying makes sense. But if you dehumanize one side or the other, well, then it's very easy to say they have no right to defend themselves. They have no right to counter-strike. How dare they? How dare they? How dare they respond to their generals being blown up at their consulate in Syria? How dare they? How dare the Israelis respond when 200, uh, you know, missiles get launched at them? It's like, well, no, I get, I totally can see why either side would respond, but you have to be able to apply it to both sides. Otherwise you sound like a lunatic. Because that way, if the United States starts attempting to strike down cruise missiles on the way to Israel next time, Iran will say, well, we have nukes and we will use those on you. We will use those on your friends. In other words, you deter and you hamstring your enemies now before they become more powerful, because otherwise they are simply going to continue to flex their muscles and push the envelope. So what does he mean by deter? Well, I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say what he means by deter is you just arm the Israelis to the end of the earth and you tell them do whatever you want. I think that's I honestly think that's his perspective. I think that's the position that he holds. There is no limit to the aid we provide. Give them weapons, give them money, tell them. Green light, green light, that, you know, do whatever you want. Sure, there's tens of thousands that are dying in, in Gaza right now. Sure, they're planning a, a ground invasion of Rafa. Sure, 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 sure. Green light, whatever. I mean, this, this is such, like, just, just extrapolate the logic here. Apply it to every other nation on earth that doesn't have nuclear weapons, which, by the way, is over 100 nations. This, this logic, this rationale would require of us or require at least our financial and military support of all of our allies to conquer every single nation on earth that might ever develop a nuclear weapon. That's the logic. Because if we don't do it now, they'll get them and then we won't be able to. So we got to do it now. I mean, 
do you not see how dangerous that is? <laughs> like, we just, we got to topple this guy and that guy and this guy and that guy and this guy. And I mean, honestly, that's what our foreign policy has been for the longest time. We did it with, with Saddam Hussein, with WMDs. We did it with uh, Gaddafi, even though, as far as I know, he wasn't attempting to build a nuclear weapon, but I'm sure they claimed he did. Uh, now we're trying to do it with Putin, even though he's already got nukes. So apparently we can still try and topple people even when they have nuclear weapons, which also defeats the entire rationale for this perspective. And yet again, the Biden administration is seeking de-escalation. There's only one reason that they are seeking de-escalation. Because again, you know how this de-escalates? Iran getting punched in the teeth. That's how this gets de-escalated. The way this de-escalates is... <laughs> you know the way I de-escalate fights? I beat the shit out of that guy. <laughs> guy slaps me, I hit him, it's over. Well, or... Guy slaps me, I hit him, he hits me, I nuke him, he <laughs> nukes back. Like... That's the only that's the only way this can end is that they get punched. Well, what about every other war that didn't ultimately go hot or like grow into an all out war when it was just a skirmish and then it becomes an all out war? Well, obviously, there are times where instead of getting hit and hitting harder, you just don't hit back and you negotiate. Sometimes that happens, Ben. I know it's hard to believe. Certainly in your worldview, it would never fucking happen. But in a world that I would like to live in, we need it to happen. Israel takes Hamas off the board as a power player. Then Israel signs a peace agreement with the Saudis. And now you have a Sunni Israeli axis that is oriented against Iran. Then that axis eventually takes out Hezbollah. And now Iran is completely surrounded and completely isolated. And that axis is also capable of taking out Iran's nuclear facilities, such that Iran can no longer pose a nuclear threat. That is the way that you de-escalate the situation. <laughs> I mean, this is so nuts, dude. So this is how you de-escalate. You have to create a, an alliance that surrounds them. And uh, and ultimately, you have to, obviously, you fire missiles on their nuclear power plants because one day they might be used to, to create nuclear weapons. And that, that's de-escalation. You have total, total conquest, total domination of, of not just this government, but, but these people. That's how you de-escalate. I mean, I'm sure there are situations in history where that that is true. I, I am I am far from convinced that the Iranians or the Iranian people would support something some you know civilization so horrific that they they must be completely isolated from the rest of the world and, and conquered. I mean, there's very there's very few examples of you know civilizations or cultures that get to that degraded a position. Uh, as far as I know. There's millions of people in Iran that are in staunch opposition to the leadership of Iran that are not at all interested in going down that path. So I just don't I don't understand the the claim here that this is the only way you de-escalate. Full conquest, that's how you de-escalate. I mean, just setting aside the obvious misnomer that you de-escalate through escalation. It's like no. <laughs> <laughs> like logically no that's not how you de-escalate is by escalating and, and it's also not how you de-escalate the situation with russia like the from his logic it would be okay well the only way that we're going to de-escalate with russia is to fire nukes because Bef i mean before they do right got to de-escalate got to escalate to de-escalate that and in fact this has been a major critique against putin for years now is that allegedly that's their policy is that they will escalate more rapidly than the their opponents this is their new strategy i guess because they feel as if they're being ganged up on but man it's super dangerous that 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 is a policy that is ultimately destined for armageddon you don't de-escalate the situation by telling iran well you know sure you attacked a sovereign state with a massive cachet of arms from your own sovereign territory but, you know, we'll call this one just, yeah, well, they, this one doesn't count. Oh, no biggie. No biggie. As former State Department spokesperson, Valley Nasser said, Iran has actually achieved deterrence against both Israel and the United States because of the U.S.'s cowardice. Well, it did create a dilemma for Iran. Iran could not just roll over and, and, and be seen within by its own population and in the region to essentially taking such a provocative uh, escalation from Israel without responding. On the other hand, they did not want to throw Prime Minister Netanyahu a lifeline. 
of basically shifting the attention from Gaza to Iran and Syria and even drawing the United States into a war with Iran. So they had to react, uh, but they had to react in a way where the emphasis was not really on retaliation, but on deterrence. And I think the deterrence was achieved not just by the military act they carried out yesterday, but, but essentially by the very effective psychological campaign that they managed through this escalation, both in Israel and also in Western capitals. So the real question is, why is the West being intimidated by a third rate power like Iran? Why is that happening? And the answer, of course, is because Joe Biden is beholden to his left wing base and he is scared of them. This is why John Kirby, national security spokesperson yesterday, suggested that it is in the chief interest of the United States to stop Israel from taking the sort of action that would stop Iran from taking future action. That de-escalation is top of the priority list. Uh, again, that's a decision that only Prime Minister Netanyahu and the War Cabinet can make. I mean, uh, again, we respect their sovereign decision-making process. Uh, what we want to see is de-escalation of the tensions. We don't want to see a wider war. And everything the president's been doing, including putting U.S. forces in the fight Saturday night to defend Israel, which I think is the first time it's ever been done, uh, is been to de-escalate, to take the tensions down, to put resources in the region, to send a strong signal uh, to anybody who might... Uh, act inimical to our interests or the interests of our allies and partners, that it's unacceptable. Yeah, again, I, I I don't actually agree that the Biden administration has everything they've done has signaled de-escalation. Certainly not the case. However, if a Ben Shapiro, George Bush type were in power, this would be a hot war against Iran right now. And it would probably be, I mean, if Hillary Clinton was in power, this would be a hot war against Russia right now. I, I have very little doubt. So this is it's bizarre that I'm I'm defending the Biden administration at all, but clearly they have not been as aggressive as some former presidents in my lifetime or would be lunatic presidents like Hillary Clinton would have been. So it's just it's just totally unfair to claim that they have been either full neocon psychopaths or you know peaceniks because that's not the case either. I mean, they've spent hundreds of billions of dollars and they have armed and funded two proxy wars simultaneously. So they're definitely not peaceniks, but it's like they're they're trying to walk this fine line where the military industrial complex continues to get paid. Uh, but ultimately, there's not a war that makes his election or his reelection chances less likely. It's it's not really tenable either way. I would like to see de-escalation on both sides. But of course, Shapiro disagrees. OK, but it's not de-escalating. If you're wearing a bulletproof vest and someone fires a gun at you and it happens to hit the bulletproof vest, the de-escalation comes when you then clock that person directly in the face. Well, see, <laughs> here's the issue, Ben, is that you directly clocked uh, two of their generals in the face just two weeks ago. So who escalated? Again, you, you got to notice, too, that clip that he ran of that uh, that lady speaking earlier they clip it so that it is never once mentioned because they, they they the the iranian guy he talks about how it was a safe phasing man, or a face saving maneuver they had to do it but they clip it so that you don't hear what they're what they're saving face from or over or or why what 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 happened from a daily wire you know viewer they have no fucking clue, I'd imagine. They literally don't know because the Shapiro's of the world are just hiding the provocations that come from one side while overemphasizing the provocations that come from the other. As opposed to just being honest that there are provocations on both sides and we got to get the fuck out of there. And take their gun away from them. Now the situation is de-escalated. It is not, in fact, a victory or a de-escalation simply to survive an attack from Iran. Iran presumably will change its MO going forward. I mean, his, his argument there would mean that the only way you could ever win a war would be to disarm your opponent as opposed to negotiating a ceasefire and everybody going home. As if that's never happened in human history. As if every war has only been ended, has only been de-escalated by total conquest of Group A over Group B. Just a flat fucking lie. That is not how world history or war has worked in the vast majority of circumstances. 
the vast majority of times people decide to stop fighting and the and one side does not entirely conquer the other that's just true so this perspective this worldview is fatally flawed and the reason i wanted to to harp on it so much today is because it's really dangerous this is as i said earlier these are the vestiges of the neoconservative strain of republicanism in this country throughout my lifetime they had been on life support in part thanks to donald trump but even more so thanks to ron paul but man it is trying it is it is it's on life support but it is oh, the heart is beating stronger and stronger and it's making me nervous and just to show you that shapiro is not alone in not just misleading his audience as to the the circumstances of this war but also i mean david cameron a very high level politician out of the uk had this to say i mean this is this is what happens when you do not know what the fuck is going on a reckless and dangerous thing for iran to have done and i think the whole world can see all these countries that have somehow wondered well you know what is the true nature of iran it's there okay. in black and white what would britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates well we would take uh, we, you know we would take the very strong action <laughs> i mean come on man I, I honestly think he doesn't know that it even happened. I don't think he even knows that the Iranian generals were blown up. I don't think he knows. How could you how could you be so unprepared? But you're still getting up there, you know, talking all this shit, just bluffing and blustering your way into fucking World War Three, and you don't have a fucking clue how we got here. Well, what would the UK do if uh, you know, our generals were struck at a consulate? Oh, we'd respond very strongly, of course. No one, no one could do that and get away with it. Well, hey, motherfucker, that's what happened. That's what happened. Okay? So can we get real? Can we start to actually talk about, like, the wrongs that are, are transpiring on both sides of this? Or no? We just have to focus on the wrongs of one, and everything that they do over here is good. World Central Kitchen workers, ah, accidental. 288 workers over the past six months, accidental. Tens of thousands of innocent civilians, accidental. But Iran, 200 shells fired after their generals are blown up. Excuse me, the generals were blown up. Let's, let's not talk about that. Uh, but once Iran sends their 200 artillery barrage, well, certainly that that has to be talked about. That has to be focused upon. And certainly Netanyahu has every right in the world to respond in whatever whatever way he wants. And if Biden pleads for some level of sanity in the response so it doesn't escalate out of control. He's a coward. He's a weakling. He's a fucking pussy. Whatever the fuck. I'm so, so tired. I'm so sick of the armchair war hawk. I'm not a military veteran. I know a ton of them because I grew up in San Diego and I saw the consequences. I saw it in their faces. I saw it in their livers more than anything. These guys came home and they were drunks because they were really fucked up because of what they participated in. And it's not that every war does that to everybody. Certainly, it, it takes a toll. But particularly when the war is immoral and they realize it in hindsight or in the interim or like while it's transpiring, it fucks you up badly. And I just don't want to see any more of it. And I'm so sick of the fucking armchair war hawks that just, they totally diminish the the price that is paid both financially, but more importantly, even the the on the soul of the soldiers that go and fight these fucking immoral, unjust, bullshit wars. And you're just going to go, ah, let's more and more and more and more and more. Oh, and I'm not, I'm not advocating that, that American troops get involved, but I am also acknowledging that American troops are already involved. It's like, it's just all duplicitous. It's all detached from reality. It's all dangerous. It's all immoral. It's all wrong. It's wrong. It's a sick worldview. It's a sick perspective. And it will lead us into absolute destruction if it isn't abated, if it isn't slowed down at a minimum on multiple fronts. And I'm sorry I focus on this stuff so much. I'm sure some of you are sick about sick of hearing about it, but I think it's really, really important. And for those that are totally uh, oblivious, if you've got friends and family that are oblivious, I would encourage you to send them this. Give them a more well-rounded perspective as to this i'm sure most of them especially if they've never heard someone like me talk will disagree wholeheartedly 
but I think it's it's really important that the Daily Wire audience out there that gets totally fucking bamboozled as to what's transpired, that they know it's way more complex. Whether you actually, actually agree with my conclusions is really kind of secondary. As long as you actually know the facts about both sides, well, then you can come to your own conclusion. But if you only know the facts about one side, well, you're just not going to make a right. You're not going to make the right call. And I think it's I think it's sad. All right, we got one more clip, and I'll get out of here. Uh, this is uh, Kirby once again being asked about why. Why is it that we would use our military to shoot down drones when it comes to Israel, but not when it comes to Ukraine, also our greatest ally, right? If the U.S. can and, and allies can help shoot down Iranian drones over Israel. Why can't they do the same over Ukraine? Yeah, I knew this question was coming too. Look, different conflicts. Different conflicts, different airspace, different threat picture. Um, and uh, the president has been clear since the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine. The United States is not going to be involved in that, uh, that conflict uh, in a combat role. And uh, we haven't. We have been providing Ukraine the tools that they need to help defend their airspace. Um, and unfortunately, we can't do that right now. Because we don't have that national security supplemental funding that uh, that they so desperately. Yeah. So let me cut to the chase here. Why is it different? Well, because Ukraine doesn't have a tremendous amount of influence over our political establishment. Not at least not to that extent. Also, Russia got a fucking crazy nuclear arsenal and a serious motherfucking military. So that's why. So the reason that we're willing to do it when it comes to Israel is twofold. Either of either of the folds that I might describe would get me labeled a whole bunch of, you know, terrible names. So I'll leave it at that. <sighs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> if you appreciate the show, please do hit the like button. Uh, hit subscribe, share it around. And last but not least, leave a, leave a five-star review over on Spotify or Apple Podcasts if you're listening. I really appreciate you guys. And if you want to clip it, uh, share it around. That's a good way to get the word out too. I'm sorry I haven't done so many episodes as of late. I do six hours per week over the best political show with Luke Radowski and it just, it wears on me. That plus every all my travel and everything else, it's very challenging. But I promise you, I will be bringing you more episodes more consistently moving forward. I am almost done with my travel schedule and uh, then I will get back to business. We've got a, a big interview coming up on Thursday that you guys are not going to want to miss. And uh, yeah, make sure you come out and say hi in Maryland. I appreciate you guys. See you soon. Peace. Welcome to Liberty Lockdown. Please scan your barcode. Your liberty ain't gone, but yeah, it's on hold. Where did it come from and where did it go?